So before I uh, took a small break on the recording, we were talking about the waterfall model and all the different things it does right and all the things it does wrong. Obviously the largest hindrance on using waterfall in real world is the fact that you can't make changes or revisions to your plans or uh, requirements once you have made your decision on what you will be doing or have, an, have the first idea what you want to do with the system. So to combat the uh, pratfalls or pitfalls of the waterfall model there's a wealth of different, uh, different other process models which fulfill the function as being more practical or real-life oriented in, compar in comparison to the waterfall approach. One of the first and most similar approaches is the spiral model. Basically the spiral model is waterfall but uh, like it, its name says it's uh, designed so that you actually work not in waterfall where we do everything just once but in a spiral or a loop where in each cycle we do goal determination try to find new requirements or alternative requirements uh, check our constraints, uh, do risk analysis develop a newer version of the prototype and verify that the things from our last version are actually functioning. So basically the idea is something like this. We start with the needs and we start with the first constraints and requirements. We do risk analysis to see or understand what could go wrong and what are the things that we have to address in our development. Create first prototype to assess how feasible everything is. Do development plan and go with the budget and start going uh, on the loop or spiral into more and more elaborate systems. For example, like here, first starting with the development plan, then going into system test plan and then on the integration plan. And finally, in all uh, mod uh, loops of the spiral, create a prototype based on risk analysis, based on budget and based on our new alternatives or constraints we have just identified. So basically this would mean that our prototype on each loop becomes more and more mature and refined and finally at some stage or some iteration it reaches the level of finesse where we can say that okay this is the uh, system we want to publish or this is the system we want to release as our actual software. So at this point we break the spiral and do unit construction uh, systems integration and start doing system testing to ensure that our current prototype or the system built out of the latest prototype fulfills all the requirements which would then mean that we go from the construction, design and requirement uh, spiral into testing work and later would go into operation. So basically what the spiral development model is, is it's a form of iterative development model. So basically all the agile models or, or on not so agile approaches or something like rational unified process uses this sort of iterative approach. It means that we do the initial planning and initial requirements gathering and initial business modeling to get the idea that would this product be feasible? Would it make money to build such a thing? Would it, be, uh, would it have enough customers to fill the uh, expenses we would uh, have to uh, from building it or if there's any commercial activity in the area where we are building something. So basically the initial planning and the initial business model is something that leads to the first of the many cycles of planning, gathering requirements, 
doing analysis and design, doing implementation, doing testing work for the existing parts, and evaluating whether or not this system actually works. So the iteration from the initial plan to uh, planning, analysis and design, implementation, testing and evaluation leads to a system that's more or less functioning uh, more and more product-like on each iteration. And it means that once we go to the testing on the later iterations, we might also decide that, okay, this is good enough, we haven't found any larger problems in last five iterations, so we might as well deploy our software to use, or meaning that we release it in App Store, or put it on box and on sale, or deliver it to our customer for their approval, or anything like that. So basically, what we have with the iterative model is that we are actually doing a series of mini projects. We are doing the requirements gathering, analysis in design, analysis and development, testing and evaluation uh, on each iteration so that we are actually always making the system more and more defined and more and more refined. It also means that we actually can collect user feedback so we can give a prototype to our potential customer or our paying customer and see what they think about it and make changes in the later versions. We may also start the design by making a placeholder object or some sort of placeholder system which would be later expanded into actual functioning software and still explore the different options or ideas before deploying the latest version somewhere, meaning that the uh, deployment here from the iteration 3 may be something completely different from iteration 1 because we found out that the customer didn't like the outcome of our first analysis and design and we make, made some drastic or major uh, major changes during the second iteration of the software. Of course, this means that we also have to have more skilled and experienced pro project management since the idea of when we are done with system, test, uh, system development or when we are uh, using a plan or design that would be good enough is more vague and it needs some experience or knowledge or uh, some ability to understand the customer to see that okay we don't need additional iteration or that we don't have to change something between the iterations. It also means that since we are always aiming our outcome towards our preferred state it means that we are able to uh, minimize the risks about the platforms or about the customer requ customer uh, requests or and these sort of things because we always have updated uh, information on whether or not the system still supports our software or whether or not the platform still has the required specifications or whether or not our target audience actually pr prefers or likes that particular genre or theme of software. For example, if you are doing uh, in games, this is something that's really easy to demonstrate. If you start to create a game uh, today, you might not want to use a theme of zombies in it because zombies are overplayed. People are becoming tired and worry of zombie stuff because it's currently pouring out everywhere. So. Uh, two years ago, your customers would have probably said that, okay, zombie horror survival is something that we like, but if you uh, are launching today something that's uh, zombie survival horror, it would be said that, okay, it's just 
one of the many zombie survival horror games, whereas with iterative development you would have known a year ago that you have to get rid of the zombies and use cowboys, and instead of horror have dinosaurs or stuff like that. So you would end up with the dinosaur cowboy simulator or something like that. But anyway, uh, the idea that the iteration and waterfall are two completely different things, of course, isn't isn't something that holds actually through, because the iteration is always more or less just a large amount of mini waterfalls. But instead of doing the entire system at once, you do the uh, uh, the plan, design, implement, and execute cycles all over, over and over and over again to get the idea of what has changed or possibly by designing one part at a time. It means that you more or less can start with the placeholder stuff and do the more refined design on the later parts or if you find something that's faulty you just throw it back into the development cycles. So that means that you have time to do, for example, testing to test the user interface again and again and again. So you are you aren't stuck with the one design you made, but you can make changes, test things, make more changes, test things, and so on and so on. Evaluate until you are absolutely satisfied with the outcome. Of course, this also means that you can find uh, several faults. Uh, rather early into the development. And this has actually significant cost effect, but I'll be getting back to that shortly. So, basically, uh, what the waterfall model does is that it actually causes the risks to become real rather late in the development. And the risks here mean all the different things like changing hardware, changing platform, uh, changing market preferences or changing customer preferences, uh, it's, they all are risks which have significant economic impacts. Also, there's the other problem that on the requirements and analysis and actually even on the design stage, you are more or less just working with paper. You are working with diagrams and designs and stuff which doesn't exist yet. So if you want to make changes, you more or less can just uh, make a change in your plan and it works that way. When you have developed something and find problem, for example in testing, you would have to make the change so that all the existing components which already have been developed, programmed and uh, quality assured, tested for that they actually function, you'd have to do that testing work all over again to make changes in one module. Even worse, if you already sold your software to your customer, it means that you would also have to take into account the different versions of platforms or different variations of mobile phones uh, which your customers might be using if you want to make one change to your software. So, not only is this pushing the only phase when we are doing testing work or you are actually seeing that everything functions correctly in the really late stage and meaning that if you are running over budget or over time you are cutting out your test cycles and that would be completely catastrophic not only because the quality is more or less the only thing you will be remembered for if you especially if you are launching crappy software because no one buys a new uh, software product unless if you if they are appalled with the quality with the existing existing product unless they are the Finnish government or government organization institutions which are for some reason married the developers who have more or less interesting tastes on what uh, the software quality means, but actually even if you are a small time operation you are having really huge uh, issues with the costs of one fault. So this more or less means that 
How much does it cost to correct one fault from your software? One fault which might be one bad requirement or one uh, error in one line of code or whatever it means that if you pay one euro for that problem to be fixed in your requirements documentation simply by getting rid of one thing or changing it to something that functions in the analysis and design phase you more or less pay a couple of euros more because you have to then check that backtrack that every other requirement functions with the correct one but that's actually nothing because from the design to implementation there's a 12 time uh, multiply, uh, a multiplier for the costs simply because you have already written the software which uses the faulty requirement or uh, you have to fix the fault by altering the code or existing components and that's more or less peanuts compared to what you would have to pay if you have to fix one fault from software that's already out, that's already launched and that's already in use somewhere. So basically not only is the waterfall approach uh, stupidly optimistic, it's also a complete nightmare to manage from the viewpoint of risk avoidance because all these uh, expensive ways to co uh, fix a fault are more or less emphasized by the way the waterfall approach tests software. So that's also one reason why software is relatively r uh, rarely developed with any sort of a straight-faced waterfall approach. It simply cannot work in practice. Okay, so uh, not is the iterative model the only obvious answer. More or less all the software process models apply some form of iteration because it, not because it's a trendy thing to do but because it's a rather natural way of doing things and it's also quite sensible in a sense that you get several times uh, to fix the problems or identify if you have to alter some designs. There's also additions to iteration or dif uh, different ways to do iterative models and one uh, thing that usually is done is the incremental development. It means that you start your first project by doing the core system and then uh, create additions or add new features or add new content packs or DLC or whatever by doing incremental work adding new stuff into the existing product. Uh, this means that on the first project you only have to have a funding to do the core product. You don't have to worry about the content because if the product starts to sell then you have uh, money to pay for the development of the incremental uh, features or additional content uh, but it also makes it possible to have really solid plan for a simple core system and then just start adding things into that one. So it also means that uh, well you can well, do the design so that when you have to uh, uh, stop incrementing, uh, the, the stop creating the incremental parts when you run out of money, or when you have to release something, or when you the requirements are met. But basically, it also means that the first increment is only the core system. The second increment is, for example, in game could be the multiplayer component or additional. A campaign or stuff like that and the third increment would be like uh, addition of clans and stuff like that. So basically it means that uh, you can start with this one even if the first increment so you start with this one even if you always thought that you want to create the third increment this one but you have to commit yourself, your money, your budget, 
your time or your well any pay, uh, any ally partner or funder basically you have to commit them to do this and you can later do that so it's more or less just uh, well one additional layer of uh, design into your software process you do the development for one incrementation in iteration but with the incremental parts which support and add to each other you just design things so that the first launch gives you the mechanics uh, or the basic parts the second part gives you the same campaign from the bad guys point of view and the third increment the second expansion disk gives you multiply multiplayer mode or stuff like that whatever you want to do and as long as these increments are economically feasible you can more or less expect to be allowed to make money for your company at least I haven't ever heard about situation where some company says that you aren't allowed to do that expansion because it would make us money I know a couple of companies which could be run that way or had make, made the business decisions that make as much sense but I haven't yet heard about anyone who actually turns down a surefire way to make money so uh, of course the increment the iter iteration incrementation and the waterfall are more or less just uh, really high-level abstract models of course if, when we go into the more practical level we see different approaches or different names or diff different commercial names for the different uh, development methods for example the rational unified process is one of the commercial methods the scrum is well it's not basically uh, commercial thing but it, it has its own works and things and you can hire someone to teach your company how to run successful scrum operation additionally something like uh, extreme programming or test driven development are also things which are more or less on more practical level on who does and what does and it's also something that you can hire people to teach your uh, teach your staff about but anyway the different additional ways of uh, well doing software development or running software development process or things like prototyping or agile approaches which I will be talking about more later or some participative development or soft systems methodology uh, methodology uh, to name a few there's hundreds of them more or less uh, and almost all companies have their own approach or their own model which may or may be not based on standards but they, but they are somehow documented and codified so that they are trying to run things systematically also taking into account that the software development process of course is the roadmap to get software created of course you can also improve your current work and that's actually something that the software process improvement does for something like capability, uh, capability maturity model CMM is uh, something that measures different things you are doing like testing or development or documentation or uh, requirements analysis activities and tries to find areas on which you could then uh, improve it's something that's com also fairly commercial work but it's also a completely separate area from software process management the software process improvement SPI is the act of enhancing your software process not basic just running it also on related areas something like open source development or development of enterprise resource planning systems ERPs, which combine not only the software process or software development process but all the activities deliveries and human resources management and stuff like that 
are also related into software development because you can't develop software in a vacuum. So, uh, on a couple of other words about the uh, high level of things. One I said several times is prototyping. And basically, this is something that uh, has its own, let's say, name, the prototyping development approach. But basically, the prototyping in more higher sense is a approach where we design something that people can comment on and then gain more uh, more opinions or ideas on how to develop our software or where to develop our software basically by giving more and more refined uh, prototype for people to work with. So it emphasizes the fact that you have to have some hands-on system which you can test before uh, you can show it to your customer since the customer is own is best when it's re when they are reflecting to something they are able to use people don't necessarily understand uh, the good design or have problems under uh, describing what they want unless they are using something and this actually is something the prototyping is something that capitalizes on this so we have high degree of iteration and we have the users participating on the work simply because we want to, the users to play with the system, use the system, try to achieve the functionalities we are designing and then see if they in practice can use the software. Of course it's also quite expensive approach because you have to build all those software but this is actually one of the only ways, uh, ways to ensure that your customer actually is able to use things. And the first prototypes don't have to be that refined. Uh, on some projects which I've been involved with, the first prototypes for user interface uh, more, were more or less mock screen captures or something drawn on the paper. Uh, the, give the idea of what the system will look like, what could happen, what would the system be doing and how for example the terminal to use your smart card, what it would look like and would it be uh, visible enough or interesting enough or identifiable enough to be used by the co potential customers or employees. So. Uh, more or less, these are the things that you can capture with prototyping. Of course, there's also some weaknesses. Uh, the prototyping work is good to uh, enforce user participation and collect hands-on experience, which gives, you, which gives you more information and you can actually avoid really bad design problems with the prototyping approach. Of course, there's also the problem that the project management is complicated and if, if your prototype doesn't go in the right direction, it might be a nightmare to try to backtrack, backtrack on what was the problem with your prototype. You may also end up with a problem that you are giving good prototypes for the people or the test users or customers so that they are wanting more and more and more features in it, which is something that we call featureitis. It means that you promise too much and you want to do, or you want to do too much, are unable to complete all the features to your final version of the software and it leads to the customer dissatisfaction because they thought that you could be able to deliver since you already gave them quite nice working version or that you promised so much that the customers had uh, expectations which you were not able to fulfill. It also may up causing problems with the schedules and uh, well you have to have the user commitment to your work. I know about one case where actually the company ordering a new warehouse management system 
didn't want to have anything to do with the company that was delivering the software. They just more or less wanted to have the software on their, on their doorstep on a burned CD for, so that they can take the disk and install the software to their system and take it into use. No time for uh, on-site testing or anything like that. And they were really surprised when the software didn't perform as they design as they thought it would be because for some reason they were completely against the idea of letting anyone test the system or test it out with their own customers or even let the developers test the, their design with the actual environment before taking it into use so of course it was complete catastrophe but well i th uh, the company uh, is or was known for its really poor middle management, so, well, that wasn't a surprise to anyone, really. Anyway, if you can't have user commitment, you can uh, create your prototypes, or you can create your prototypes, but you can't collect information about it, about the work, and that's one of the problems you may run. Okay, so a couple of more slides about the different things about how to manage projects, software development projects, and in general the many development work. There's also some standards on this area. For example, this ISO IEC 29110 is uh, interesting because it plans to give a really low level, uh, hands on, uh, low level hands on. Uh, definition on what you need. So you need project planning work, execution work, assessment and control and closure and you have to have a plan, you have to have repositories for your software, uh, records for your meetings, records for your change requests, some status records and acceptance records and the so final software configuration which you will deliver when the project is closed, then that's uh, the software you created. So this more or less tries to define the basic functionalities. Of course, it is always problems with these sort of approaches, but also the international standards are uh, standardization bodies are getting interested in actually defining these sort of things or defining what's the good way or best practices of developing software. Of course, there's no easy answer. I'm fairly certain that there's also not one true answer here, but still it's something that you can use as a guideline, especially if you are in, in a company or country which doesn't have tradition on software development or you are just launching a company without actually having a degree on software engineering or computer science or anything like that. Additionally, I'd like to point out about the open source development uh, in this context of software uh, process models that the open source development is actually a really different thing from the way the software companies make business. So, first of all, you have developers who choose what they want to work on, and you have the requirements from the open community of users and developers. So, you more or less, to be able to develop the software with developers who may or may not work on things, you have to create modular design, and you also tend to be limited to development tools which are freely available or public, uh, publicly accessible. So it's also something that limits your project when you have to think about the infrastructure you have to build for development work. And of course, since no one is profiting money, it's the personal interest incentive uh, which runs the in incentives of working for the project. So more or less you can't uh, hurry things uh, by threatening anyone with uh, by saying that they will lose their job if they miss their deadline or you can't pay the developers to hurry up or anything like that because that's not how open source projects tend to work.
So the question remains, if the open source development is that different, then is it interchangeable with, with the software process models we've been talking about for uh, last uh, hour and almost a half now? Because there's simply so many different things. You don't have customer, you don't have profits or monetary involvement, you have people who you really can't dictate on that you have to work on the user interface or you have to do the design and the requirements are more or less coming from people who have all seen that there's need for this sort of software you aren't trying to find out if there's room for yet another world of tanks clone or yet another world war two shooter game you just uh, are just uh, participating in a project that has found out, for example, that there's a need for open source alternative for Microsoft uh, Office tools, or that there's a real need for software development environment, which more or less runs on any system capable of using a graphical user interface, so that in every place you would have the same things in same places and same uh, same instructions would be usable in any environment. So, I don't know, maybe the open source development could benefit from application of software process models or uh, doing it more rigidly, but the open source development is completely different beast from the commercial world I've been talking about for the first part of this lecture. Well, second part of the recording, but still the first part of the lecture, since the second part of the lecture uh, of this lecture is the agile approaches. So, uh, at this point, we are all already uh, past the half hour mark. So I'll be getting a second break here, and we will go through rest of the slides in the part three.